tonight of the series, The Last Years of the Old Order of Israel and the Jews in 1962-66. And, of course, tonight is a, a doozy because it's called Where is Yussel at the State of Israel and Jewish Religion, 1962-66. to 66. And I keep getting these feelings every time I go through material, we can barely scratch the surface on this stuff. As we talk about uh, Efo Yussel, the State of Israel and Jewish Religion, in 6266, it's a big topic, and I cannot cover the state of Israel and the Jewish religion in 966. But as is always the case with history, what you do is you take a few of the facts and you try to make a sort of a mystical argument that if you understand these set of uh, phenomena, you can kind of get a feeling, the argument is, a feeling for what was going on um, in this particular subject during those years. I start out by pointing out that the United States of America is the only country in the world with separation of church and state. And if you know that or not, but there is no other country in the world that has legal separation of church and state. I didn't say they're not democratic, because there are plenty of countries that are democratic. But the concept of a legal separation of church and state is only American. And obviously it goes back to the guys who wrote the Constitution and things like that. Uh, other countries have different arrangements. I would not say Great Britain is a uh, fascist state, it's a democratic state. But as you all know, the Queen of England is officially the head of the church. And besides that, the British government does subsidize and does indeed undertake to control, um, if they're up to par, a religion, as does every country in the world except the U.S. government, and, although they kind of do here also. The reason I put uh, Nikki Morgan up there, she's the uh, current, under Cameron, she's the uh, education secretary, and she's the one who's implementing uh, policies which basically I approve of, and that is, Derek said like this, we're not going to have Muslim schools where they just teach jihad, you understand? And we're going into the schools... The government is going in like Big Brother into the schools to find out what exactly they're teaching and, uh, and ram it down their throats and hire and fire and do all this sort of thing. Um, as you know, uh, the Jews are often collateral damage, so I'm sure everybody here reads the paper, and they're now forcing the government is saying that every school, including the religious schools, have to teach another religion in addition to their own. Uh, and in the case of the, uh, of the Jewish schools, I'm talking about the Hasidic schools and all the stuff, the government is forcing them to teach in addition to the Jewish stuff another one. I don't know how this is going to turn out. And the chief rabbi of England picked Islam over Christianity, for better or worse. And uh, it's, just, it's going to be an interesting day uh, over there, you know, when this hits bells and uh, Satmer, you know. But anyway, you see, you can read the paper. I, mean, I, I don't know if you follow this sort of thing. The, 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 what I'm trying to say is like this. There is no um, shame or effort to separate the church from the state. The state is in charge. As long as you behave yourself, do what you want. When you don't behave yourself like it's going with the jihadi business, then the state says, we want to interfere. One of the problems you have in America is, we all want money for the private schools, but if all the money goes for private schools for the jihad business, so then what are we funding? You understand? And then you tell me you can't tell, you know, that America has a, has a tradition of a decentralized education system with local boards of education, as you possibly know. America has a tradition the government doesn't really poke its nose into what's taught in the private schools. They can if they want, but they generally don't. But this is changing because it's a new world. As long as it's just you know, Christianity and Judaism, um, big deal. The government doesn't really care what Satmar does. You understand? Not really the uh, state of New York. But uh, because they weren't planning to overthrow the government. But now that you have all this big Islamic set of schools coming in with the Wahhabis and, 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 and the ISIS supporters and who knows what, the U.S. government say this, you know, we, we need a culture change. So I'm just trying to tell you that when you get to Israel, as I'll do in a minute, they don't have a separation of church and state. No country in the world has separation of church and state except the U.S. In Western countries, now listen closely, in Western countries, religion, which has always meant the difference between Catholic and Protestant, is not that big of a deal in terms of national identity. Secular identity trumps. Now, once upon a time, that wasn't true. And if you go back a couple hundred years ago, you had the wars of religion and the 30-year wars and all this kind of stuff. And A shechted B and B shechted A. That happened long ago. But we're past that in the Western world. Okay? Happened long ago. We're past that. It doesn't really matter in England whether you're uh, a Catholic or Protestant. Or even in France or Germany or places like that. You know, it makes a little bit of a difference. and It does. But not in a significant kind of way. And my point is, an Italian feels Italian, whatever his religion is. A Swiss feels a Swiss, whatever religion generally speaks. A German feels a German, whatever. There's a little nuance here and there between this type of Catholic, this type of Protestant. I get that. But overall, it hasn't made a difference. That, what I just described is what we call the Western tradition. But in the Middle East, it's different. Religion trumps 
secular nationality as the primary and real mode of self-classification. You go in all these countries and say, what are you? You know, if they're not just being politically correct, they'll say, I'm a Shiite, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Druze, I'm a Christian, I'm a Maronite, I'm a Jew. That's the real one, <laughs> right? That's why Syria and Iraq have never really been countries. Not from the time they were founded after the First World War. Look at the, uh, you know, here's your, uh, you know what I mean, religious division. I think this is the Sunni part, and you know, this is the Shia part, and this is a piece of the Druze, and so on and so forth. By the way, you look at this map, you understand where the ISIS comes from, because they've been ruled by the Assad dynasty, which is not Sunni Muslim, and the overwhelming majority is, and they don't like it. Where is the ISIS located? Right there in Syria, as you, as you know. This is why. You see? I, what about the fact that Assad and the other regimes have been saying, oh, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is a Syrian national identity. Baloney. And look at Iraq. Same thing, you know. This part is the, 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 the Sunni, I think, and this the Shiite, and whatever, you know, and, and, and the Kurds and so forth. It's, 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 it, notice, that's your primary mode of identity. And if somebody, like a foreign statesman, like Woodrow Wilson, these people, stuck them all together, it's a bit shidduch, we all know this. Now, in pre-1948, the primary religious, uh, the primary identity in Palestine was religious, even if you're not religious. The way they identified you, right, whether you're Ben-Gurion or the Ger Rebbe was, you're all part of what they call the Yishuv. It's this type of Jew or that type of Jew. It wasn't that there's a Palestinian identity. The country was actually quite riven precisely along religious lines, whether you want to you know, admit it or say it or not. You understand? No, the category was Jew. The category was Muslim. The category was Christian. Now, the Muslim and Christian tried to amalgamate and call it an Arab identity, but really it was a lie. Um, the Christians, I mean, it was primarily a, a, the struggle of the Palestinians against Zionism. In those years, it was, it was primarily a religious struggle, which is why the leader was, was the, the leader of the Muslim church, if I can use that term, in Palestine. Now, there were Christians over there, but if you know what happened, and I spoke about this in the past, the Christians, like today, followed a mufti out of fear. And perhaps some, some uh, conviction. George Antonis was a famous Christian uh, Palestinian, you say today, who wrote the book The Arab Awakening. He was a highly educated guy in the 20s and the 30s. Um, in, in the, and he had a job with the high commissioner in Palestine, and he was a spokesman for the Christian Palestinians and the Arab, Palestinian secular Arab nationalism. He had to follow the Mufti 100%. That's what happened. As long as he went along, he's okay. If he will disagree, one of the squads will bump him off. That's how it goes. Now, by the way, it so happened he hated the Jews passionately, and he dropped that at a young age, which is fine with me, and his wife kept up the cause for many years afterwards, she lived in, in East Jerusalem and in Jordan, uh, K. Antonius and, and, and so forth. And these are people, as we know, it's part of the Palestinian condition that even the Christians, uh, the Palestinian Christians, hate the Jews more, as much as and more than they hate the Muslims. They're not interested in the argument, hey, you know, if the Muslims win, it'll be worse for you. They don't think like that. Okay? So all I'm trying to say is religion, religion, religion is the number one factor, whether you like it or not, in terms of self-identity. After 48... <sighs> What happens? The Palestinian Arabs are inside the state of Israel. But what are they? Are they Palestinians? No, they're Israelis. Point. He says, yeah, ask Ben-Gurion. Uh, there are no Palestinians here. They're Israelis. What are they? They're of different religions. That's all. So is the Jewish Israelis? Is the Muslim Israelis, if you want to call it that? The Christian Israelis? Of course, they're Arab speakers. He's not stupid. He knows that. But they're not one big group. They're several. This is a, a basic strategy that I've spoken about before of divide et impera, divide and conquer, which was a fundamental feature of the Ben-Gurion system. So, there's Druze, there's Christians, there are Muslims. They're not the same. And by the way, there is truth in that. You get it? The Druze don't really feel that they're brothers with the Muslims. The Muslims would like to kill them. They probably would like to kill the Muslims if they were strong enough. That's how it goes. The Christians in Israel are in a hot spot. If they really, 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 really felt that Israel was going forever, which they never will feel, then they'd probably side with the Jews. But they're afraid the Muslims will come back one day and they'll kill us if we sided with the Jews. What I'm trying to tell you is it's religion, religion, religion as the unit of, of self-identification. So for Ben-Gurion and company, it was a matter of state policy to regard Israeli non-Jews in terms of their religious communities. So there's not a bunch of Arabs over here. There's different groups. There's the Christians, which is one thing. There's the Muslim, which is another thing. There's the Druze, which is a third thing. The Circassians, the Baha'i, and whatever other group. And if we could, if we could persuade you know, any of these groups to subdivide even more, believe me, the government would fund it. They'd be happy to do so. Okay? Now, these religions that I'm speaking about are not, are, are not merely collections of theologically like-minded individuals, which is what you have in America. Okay? 
What are the Presbyterians? What are the Catholics? They're collections of theologically like-minded individuals. But rather than the Middle East, they're still old-fashioned, autonomous, coercive communities. And Ben-Gurion did not wish to abolish that. He does, however, treat the different communities differently. So the Christians, for example, who are quite small in number, are readily granted their traditional hierarchies with whom the regime was able to negotiate on behalf of their flock. So we talked about this guy last year, Archbishop Hakim. When it's the Christians, it's a machaya, because the Christians are always a hierarchy. There's always somebody at the top, a, a pope, a bishop, an archbishop, a patriarch, or whatever you want to call it. And that makes it a machaya for the government, because you make a deal with him, and that applies to all the followers, because they defi- define themselves hierarchically. You understand? If you make a deal with the Catholic Church, the Catholics are going to go along with that. So that's when the, 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 What about the Muslims? Now, what I'm trying to show you is what a lot of people don't get, most people, and that is, why does Ben-Gurion care about the Jewish religion? Why does he want to be part of the Jewish religion? Because the Jewish religion is one of many religions in the state of Israel. And the government had to develop for its own purposes um, a certain kind of set of policies towards religious groups. And it couldn't do it only for the Jews and not for the others, or the others not for the Jews. And therefore it had to apply it across the board. And so what do you do with the Muslims who were in Israel after 1948? What are they? Now, there were plenty of Muslims in Israel, tens of thousands. They would like if they could get it, a national church with a hierarchy headed by the Grand Mufti, all paid for by the government, just like the Christians. That's what you had under the British for 30 years. Um, let me explain. When the British took over after the First World War and set up the mandate, so they had the first high commissioner, uh, Herbert Samuel, and one of the things he did was pass a law in which he said all the Muslim communities in Palestine now belong to one entity and is headed by a top official and he gets to appoint everybody around the budget. And that guy's called the Grand Mufti. He just made a big mistake by picking the guy that he picked. And we all know it was a terrible situation. But the theory was that the Christians have a hierarchy and the Jews, as you know, they created a chief rabbinate. And so similarly, they wanted to create a Muslim chief rabbinate, so to speak, and have a single structure that united all the Muslims. And, and he did too good of a job of it. Let's put it that way. Now, the Muslims, now the state of Israel happens in 1948-49. They say, okay, get another Grand Mufti. You get it? No, let's pick your own guy, but set us all up so we should be organized as a state to represent the interests of the Muslim religion, ma- administer the Muslim property, a karka that was plenty, as I'll tell you in a second, and so forth. This is what they wanted to do. Or, if you don't do that, they said to Ben Gurion, let's have ch- separation of church and state so we Muslims can do our own thing and voluntarily will unite under one national group like they do in the United States. They'll have power that way. After all, they, they, in this country, the religious groups have plenty of power, don't they? Now, if they're able to organize their followers, uh, you know, the right wingers, the this wingers, that wingers, they're able to do it. Ben Gurion said from day one, "No Grand Mufti, thank you very much. We are not going to do this. I'm not appointing. A, there was a mistake to put this guy in the first place, and we're not getting any successor. I don't want the state of Israel have to deal with a guy like that because then what's he going to do? Attack Israel, bring in the media, cause us nothing but trouble. Why should I do that? Such an official will be able to oppose the state of Israel in the name of Islam. Thanks. That'll be terrible PR. So who needs it? So don't appoint a guy like this." Moreover, such an official or such a church could claim, they could claim the Waqf territory, of which it was a tremendous amount of, of, of abandoned territory. I mean, when the Arabs left or were kicked out in 48, uh, you know, close to a million people, there's a lot of karka and, 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 and the property which belonged to what they call the Hegdish, you know, that belonged to the Islamic religion that was originally set up for the widows and orphans and things like that. They have their own culture with their own traditions of tzedakah and hegdish like we do. And it's extensive. It's all over Israel. And Israel, frankly, wanted the territory. But they wanted it. And so by using bureaucratic and uh, administrative measures, which I don't blame him, uh, he simply was able to prevent anything, any Muslim entity from even happening during the Ben-Gurion era. I, I mean, perhaps even down till today. There's no such thing as a single entity of all the Muslims recognized in law to represent the totality of Islam um, in Israel, certainly in Ben-Gurion's time. To prevent all this, he had the state closely control Islam. The state under Ben-Gurion appointed the clergy. You hear what I said? The government appointed the clergy. So you want to be a rabbi or a qadi or you know, some uh, mosque or something like this, the government had to appoint you. And, be- make, and believe me, they made it their business to appoint people who are not scholars or impressive figures. They just wanted factotums, people know how to run the services, you know, do the life cycle events. Nobody's a chash of an Islamic scholar. The state 
prevents the establishment of any grand mufti, the establishment of any yeshivas. They would not, Ben Gurion would not allow any madrasas. You understand? They would do, not going to let it. This state prevents any gathering of representatives of Muslims' communities. So they're never, by using administrative measures, they were able to abort it, prevent it from even happening in the first place, rather than have it happen and then ha- have trouble from them. That was the uh, Ben Gurion policy. In other words, the state used its power to successfully prevent an Israeli Islam from getting its act together and challenging the state. The state of Israel seizes many mock lands, and there's no official body representing the Israeli Islam who to, to, to complain about it. This, my friends, is how they ran the show. So in general, Islam during the Ben-Gurion era was anemic during Ben-Gurion and Eshkol time. It was anemic up to the 67 war, and that's what they liked. Because they said, listen, if you leave alone, they'll rise up against us, they'll make a fifth column, they'll, 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 we'll have the trouble we have now with people stabbing everybody in the streets. I'm not going to have that. So that's, that's the way they looked at it. From all this, we see, I would argue, why a Mapai secular regime wanted to maintain a legal connection with religion, even though it meant funding religion. Because funding is how you control. Indeed, the giving and withholding of funding were precisely the tools of control. You understand? So that's why Israel did not have separation of church and state. And on the other hand, even as a secular regime, they did want to fund, but they want to fund the right people at the right time, withhold the, from, from the people they held with at the right time also. This helps us understand why in the case of Judaism, Ben-Gurion did not simply separate the church and state. Why he didn't decline to fund parallel school systems. You understand what I'll say it again. Ben-Gurion, for whatever reason we've talked about in the past, he set up, in his time, he presided over the establishment of a system in which there's three public school systems, correct? There's Mamachti, Mamachti Dati, and the Chinuch and that sort of thing. So that means that it's all funded by the taxpayers. It's parallel school systems. You get it? You, the, 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 the parents have the choice. I'm talking about under the law. You can send your kids to a secular school. That's totally up to you. You can send your kids, again, a tax for free, a public school, to a Mizrahi-type school, religious Zionist, Keep pastor God if you want. Or you can do to the, you can send your kid for the younger grades um, to, to uh, go to school. Right? And, and again, it's free or just it's, 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 it's paid for by the government. So thus starved of funds, if he had not done this, for whatever reason, it would have been hard for religious institutions, including Jewish ones, to be created or survive. But they, they, they couldn't make it on their own. Uh, because expenses, anybody here, and I'm sure in this audience, we must have people connected with TA, Beis Yaakov, and there is a, it's a fortune. No, no, I'm saying to run an institution called a fortune. You understand? People, people don't understand. It's big expenses. The food, the teachers, the building, and, you know, after all the jokes, to run the lights, it costs over. They couldn't, they couldn't do it. Okay? Um, but Ben-Gurion wanted to make sure that Judaism would never get out of control and turn into a threat to the state, because religion always has this this potential, agreed? Religion can always get out of control, be a threat to the state. Haven't we all read this headline this past week with the wedding? You all know what I'm talking about. With the radical right wing, they're stabbing the baby and all that. It's, it, it has the power to get out of control, okay? So, uh, in addition, Ben-Gurion and his uh, company were heirs to the Jewish political tradition of Eastern Europe and not of Central Europe. They were not Hirschian, let's put it that way. Since Rafael Hirsch, perhaps you remember, uh, espoused the idea that, uh, there, that, that the uh, religious, in his case the Orthodox, should on principle separate and have a separate community, a parallel community with the others. Because the others are treif, they won't, they won't believe in the Torah. And because of the Torah, any Jewish institution they talk about is ipso facto going to be a treif one. And Hirsch, who had a rich congregation, put his money where his mouth is. So let's put it this way. If, this was, if they had this in Baltimore, there wouldn't be any protests about the JCC opening on Saturday. Say, the heck with them. Make our own JCC. Run, run the place on, on, on Yom Kippur if you want. Make our own uh, you know, JCC with our own swimming pool, our own everything, and our own schools, and our own hospital, by the way. The heck with Sinai Hospital. Let them eat trafe all they want. Or I mean, Toda. You know, th- th- this was his, his approach. Not in Eastern Europe. And Zionism rose out of Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, for a variety of reasons, I'm not going to re- repeat it, I did in the past, that didn't happen. Instead, what everybody said was, call Yisrael Haver, whether we like it or not. And we hate each other and we cuss each other out, all the rest of it, we're all part of a family. Nobody likes their cousins. Raise your hand if you like your cousin. Anyway, they, you know, <laughs> how many liars do we have? I see two, you know, okay. <laughs> right? You know, everybody, it, 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 this is the way it goes, but we're all going to do it. So in Eastern Europe, they had Kehillas once upon a time down to the Holocaust. And there were legal institutions, for example, in Poland, Lithuania, places like that, Hungary. There were legal institutions, they had real elections, and they were in charge of actual budgets. Okay? Sort of like running the Associated, you might say. But there was, there was mamish elections, you know, not like here where it's a self-perpetuating oligarchy. There, there actually were, were elections. 
And what used to happen was so and so many votes went to the religious party, and so and so many went to the secular party, and so and so went to the social party. When the votes are all over, let's say it's Warsaw, or Lodge, or Vilna, or Kovna, or something like this. So this is the system. When it's all over, so now let's say there are 25 seats on the executive board, or 50 seats. So 10% went to this group, and 10% went to that group, and 20% went to this group, and 30% went to this group. And when it's all over, they've got to form coalitions to pass uh, you know, resolutions and, and use the budget, raise money, and so forth. And so in that kind of environment, what happened was the religious and non-religious had to cooperate one way or the other, whether they like it or not. And so what they usually would used to do in Eastern Europe was uh, what they ended up doing in Israel, which is the religious groups you give them in charge of the cemetery and of the mikvah, and of the, 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 the religious school, and the kashras, and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, the big bucks will run for our, our, our sorts of things. And that's how they did it, you know, like it or not. So that, is the, the, that bespeaks a culture in which they're all out to get us, therefore we have to hang together, and despite our differences, we have to work it out. Like I say, I have to work it out with my cousins. And, um, uh, you know, it's called if I can use that term. And this is, as they say before, the cultural context that emerged out of all, all this, and therefore when Israel became a state, it's only natural that even secularists, Ben-Gurion, all the rest of us, said, we should bring that institution into Israel. And that's exactly what they tried to do. The Mizrahi should be in charge of the religion, they should be in charge of the mikvahs, of the cemeteries, of, uh, you know, of the rabbis, the shochet, that sort of thing. And, and for the rest of it, please leave us alone. Don't tell me what to do. Stripped of all the verbiage and reduced to its essence, the Mapai had no problem uh, funding religion in every area of life except education. Because that's the dangerous one. So Rav Maimon, who was Ben Gurion's best friend, he was a minister of religion. Uh, there were no yeshivas, as you'll see, not really. And so he said, we want to have laws that the Shabbos should be the, the official holiday, and that the government should keep kosher in the institutions, and that they should. It's Ben Gurion's a fine, you know, big deal. And even if it, it comes at the blue laws and things like that, you know, can't open the store, big deal. That, is, that was a price he's willing to pay. You see, in the early years of the state, there weren't any Mizrahi yeshivas. You know what I said? Their name is Mizrahi Yeshiva. Members of groups like Bnei Akiva didn't go to Yeshiva. Yeshivas were not part of the Mizrahi sociology or ecology. Later it changed, but not the time I'm talking about. At the most, the boys and the girls who really were interested attended teacher seminaries. So the famous great Rab Zemin taught in the teacher seminary, in the Mizrahi teacher seminary. You understand? Because there weren't any Mizrahi. It's just, it's just interesting. Here's a person, if you want to get down to it, who could have given easily a share, you know, and like and all that stuff. But being in Israel when he was, that's, that, was, that was what was out there. And my point is that religious Zionism during the Ben-Gurion era agreed with the Mapai in everything except religion. It was like a Mapai light. And the Maftal, the religious uh, party, the Zionist, religious Zionist party, was essentially kind of a branch of the Maftal, of the Mapai, excuse me. And so that's why they're always in, together in a coalition. Yes, they quarreled over money and they quarreled over this, that, and the other, and who's a Jew. And, but, you know, the little quarrels covered up the fact that 99% of the stuff they agreed on. Accordingly, Ben-Gurion and company were prepared to grant concessions, especially about blue laws and Shabbos and Geiris and marriage and divorce to these groups. And the feeling was, and he wasn't necessarily wrong, listen closely, within a generation or two, the religious Zionists, as they are now, will no longer be religious. Right? That's what he figured. But the kids at that time were coming out of the seminaries and Benakiv, all the rest of it. After a few years, it became quote-unquote normal, you understand? Even if we fund their school system, the secularization process will take place. Hence the willingness to make concessions to the National Religious Party. That's a basic feature of the Ben-Gurion era. But now we come to the other side. The other shoe is going to drop. On the other hand, the Haredim were different. Right? They were different. The Haredi Yeshiva is actually a highly subversive institution. That's what it is. Right? That, 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 that's, uh, it doesn't claim to be anything other than that. It always has been. You understand? It has been. To, f- let me tell you this way. The whole America says you should do this, and the Yeshiva and Lakewood say you should do that. The whole America says you should work and do such and such, and the Lakewood, I'm using that as an expression, says you should do that openly and proudly and boldly. Right? The whole America now says you have gay marriage, the Yeshiva says gay marriage is, is wrong. You understand? Those are countercultural institutions. That's how they self define. You get it? And, yeah, people don't like it. Okay, that's what happens when you have a countercultural institution that takes its role seriously and is subversive of the general culture, whether in America, the West, or in the state of Israel. It is a subversive institution. It, because they said, listen, we're, we're, we're pushing a culture that long predated any of your ideas. Okay? Who gave you permission to be Michal Shabbos, so to speak? You get it? And we're, we're, we haven't changed the message, they argue, you know, the, the message is still the same. You're the one who changed. 
It always has been. So the, so the cultural subversion, subversive nature of the Haredi Yeshiva is, is a very powerful, powerful force. So even though they look like old rabbis, actually, uh, they're, they're, they're um, active subversives of a culture. Uh, see, the, the laughing, I, I get it, but the laughing you're doing, I'll, I'll say another sentence, you won't laugh anymore. Now they're like a, the, the biggest group uh, growing in Israel. All of a sudden, all the people who smile turn and, and nod their heads. <laughs> you understand? You get it? So um, Ben-Gurion was quite aware of this a uh, half century ago, 60 years ago, and he did not agree in 1948 to fund the yeshivas. You hear what I said? He would, not, he would not fund the yeshivas. He did find it necessary for coalition reasons to fund to a limited degree the Chinuch and the Beis Yaakov system. Oh, the Beis Yaakov did have a high school, and that turned out to be a very subversive sort of institution because that meant that you could have a whole network of schools in which girls who are super from can find government jobs with pensions and health benefits and all the rest of it, and that created a core of people who could marry yeshiva guys. I mean, you know, that's a, people have done research on that recently. But uh, these basically, when fund, there were no Haredi secondary schools no, in terms of secondary education. If there were, he didn't fund it. He wouldn't pay for yeshiva katanas, ninth grade, tenth grade, all the rest of it. Um, and not only because there wasn't money around, he, he didn't want to perpetuate this. Yeshiva which are secondary and post-secondary institutions of totalizing transformation, because that's what they are, were few in those early years. Ben-Gurion knew about their nature. He freed them from the draft, since most of the Haredim were serving in the army anyway, contrary to popular belief. If you go back in Ben-Gurion's time, I put the Ger Rebbe up there. The Ger Hasidim all went to the army. Most of the Hasidim, the ones I know about, all, all, all went to the army. You understand? It was a few people in those times, very few, that were learning yeshiva full-time that weren't going in the army. Most people, if they were a good all the rest of it, they, I mean, I know, you probably might know people also. They were a good types all the rest of it, and they said they put their two years in with three years or whatever in, in the army. You understand? So it wasn't a big kind of uh, uh, phenomenon. The hot-button issue in those days was gius bonos and not gius bonim. Right? Drafting the girls. Here's where the famous Rosh Hashiva, that's uh, Rizzo Zalman Meltzer right there, and that's I can't remember who, uh, but uh, that's Porsche. He says, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, these are big Rosh Hashivas who went to see Ben-Gurion over the girl drafting, not the boy drafting. And that was a big, a big issue in those days. Ben-Gurion is quite aware, because he's prime minister, of the subversive nature of uh, potential, rather, the subversive potential of the Haredim. In good Eastern European style, he sought to bridge gaps. You understand? Like they did in Vilna and Kovna and all the rest. Knows, How can we make this work together? Here, I just picked up a meeting of Ben-Gurion with these Russian Shiva, as I just said before. Take a look at what's said over there. Uh, a rare glimpse in former Israel, consists of a 1953 document, and oh, that's what it is. It was uh, Mayor Karelitz and, uh, and who is it? C. Pesach Frank, that was the other one. These are famous Rabbanim of yesteryear. Some of you know I'm talking about not. Very famous. C. Pesach Frank began the meeting by saying Jewish law uh, prohibited women from being drafted in the army, any kind of nation service. Uh, we respectfully we request you nullify this idea, and so on and so forth. God forbid, divine consequence of drafting the girls, and silence reigned in the room. Rabbi Frank wept, and the other ones uh, emitted heart uh, breaking sighs. Uh, now, Tzvi and Frank was not even a good to be perfectly honest. I mean, he, was like, he was a friend of Rav Cook. You get it? He was the Rav of the old Yerushalayim. Uh, and ne- but nevertheless, when it, and, and I might say. He had a son who was in, in the Mapai, I think, or the Mapam, a uh, Chaver Knesset. But he didn't hold that way, you see? And uh, adding repentance, there are Karelis told Ben-Gurion, with great love for a holy land, and you're living trembling, what will happen over here and all the rest of it. And Ben-Gurion acknowledged that he was sitting among greatness. I sit before you, great all the rest of it. And somewhere along the line, I can't see it so well, but you can. He says, uh, you know, I, I regret myself, I never learned uh, in yeshiva, I never learned Torah. You see, those, I know this is a bad thing. So he tried to, the point's like this, tried to bridge a gap. You understand? Now, it turned out that it wasn't exactly bridgeable, was it? You see? That's the thing. That's by, because by him, bridging gap is, what does it take for me to, for, for you guys to agree to what I'm saying? And, well, that's, that's usually how bridging gaps it works. And, uh, you know, when are you, when are you going to see how right I am? And the fact of the matter is, uh, what, what I'm trying to get across is that uh, there was no common ground. Uh, later on, Ben Gurion met with the Chazanish. This is very famous, and he saw there's no common ground on the Hashkafa level. There's no violence. It's a subversive attitude that's not violent at all, right? Has uh, you know the Chazanish? They never said that nobody should lift a finger to do anything. They're, they're against against violence, but nevertheless, mentally speaking, it, it's a complete subversive uh, rejection. 
I have in front of me, there's a famous speech where Ben-Gurion went to, he's in the Chazanisha's house. You see, it's a very simple room. He didn't even have a chair. They sat on the bed, you know. That's a very, very, uh, lived a poor lifestyle on purpose. And I uh, just want to read you a slight bit I pulled off <coughs> from a website the other day where Yitzhak Navon, who later on was the president of Israel, if you know his career, he's Sephardi from Yerushalayim, grandson of Machnefrayim, or a descendant, and uh, he was Ben-Gurion's secretary. And he was with him when he went to the city of Chazanish. Okay? He's a Sephardi, but educated with the Hebrew University. That's who he is. And... Uh, uh, like I say, I'll just I'll just read you the highlights that I uh, that I highlighted, and he said Lidvara Botozmanom da Perkas Ara Saviv Sugiakios Banosh. This was a, the, the big fight at that time was drafting the girls, and he said I came into a house Malais Farim. It was a house full of books, and no, you can see it's not a fancy house. Uh, no furniture. Hachazanish Hayinamuch Kama Imeilaim Chachmot. A little guy, the Chazanish with uh, uh, intelligent eyes. He built Ben Gurion to save upon him. He greeted Ben Gurion very cordially, and Ben Gurion immediately said, "Bossi elecha l'shol otcha ech nuchal lechiot ba'aris yehudim datim yehudim she'enam datim." How are we going to live in this country? The religion is not religion. What, what, what are we supposed to do? Mitli shenit potzeit mibifnim without blowing up. What, what, what's your plan? How, how is this? Way? Now, isn't this interesting? This is 1953, which is 50 years before all the junk that we're going through now. Uh, the country is full of people with different ideas, different hashkavas. How are we going to all coexist? Um, and the Chazanish answered according to this: Yesh halacha shim shnei gvalim tzadim mishol echad. It's a famous thing: is if if there are two camels and one's laden and one's the other one laden, one has to give way for the other. Basically, the idea being like this: that the from Jews are 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 uh, have uh, substance and not from Jews. So you so you should accommodate us. That's basically what it boils down to. And Ben Gurion said like this: "We're a, a gamal b'li klum, you know. Atach uh, Hashem shal a gamal is that elam asa? Do you think this camel pointing himself is not carrying anything? Habitachon heish yashvush hit yashvut haklitat aliyah zelom asa? Aren't we doing something? Bringing in people and setting up the country and the immigration and and national security zelo nakra mitzvot? It's not a mitzvah also to protect the country and." Uh, the Chazanish said like this, B'schus cha'anu lomdim Torah, atem yecholin l'asot mashe atem ritzim. His our position is, it all comes because we're learning. And, you, and, and, and that gives you the ability to do it. Therefore you have to accommodate us. You have to give in to us. And, you know, Ben Gurion went back and forth on this sort of thing. Eni mezalzel b'Torah, I'm not making fun of learning. I will, in lo yu anashim chayim mihel b'Torah. In other words, without the army, nobody will learn because they'll kill everybody, the Arabs. And the Chazanish says, Eitz Chaim Hisam Chaim, the Torah will protect us. It's Eitz Chaim. And Ben Gurion said, Gam Haganah Nefeshi Mitzvah, right? Protecting life is also a mitzvah. Kakaz of Kilo, Mesim, Hallelujah, the dead do not praise God. Ech Bechozos Ani, Ach Bechozos Ani Shol, Ech Nich Biachan. But no, let's talk Tachlis. How can we make this work? And the Chazanish says, Ani Roy Chil Shabbat. I see Chil Shabbat, which is not a little thing. You see, on a shim no sim liam the makom lispal. Instead of going to davening on Saturday morning, people go to the beach. The motor roll kind of instead of uh, you know davening, learning zem makom zem v'zeh misazeta never shlorz over sin chol shabbos. To see this kind of chol shabbos in Eretz Avotenu is shocking. That's what he said. And Ben Gurion said, just trying to give you a flavor over here of what eventually turned into a dialogue at a death. No, it didn't. It didn't work. You see, Ben Gurion said. I don't travel, I don't go to beach on Shabbos, right? Who learned to say, Shabbat Liam? Paulim, Shavdim, Kol Shua, Loma Giam, Libob, Shabbat. Guy works hard all week. He, you know, he wants to take a day off on Saturday. What's your problem if he goes to the beach? You can't force them to learn. No, if they wanted to, they could go to Shul. They're choosing not to go. They are Jews, aren't they? If they don't go to beach, you think they'll go to Shul. If they don't go to beach, you think they'll go to Shul. Okay? Hachazini Shamar, Ani Mamin, Shiavo, Yom, Bukum, Yishmu, Shabbat. He said, I can tell, I live with the belief that one day they'll all keep Shabbos. They are their children and their grandchildren. Fiat Paolo, and they will David. You see? So, you, I'm try, you know, it's two different hashkafot, as they say over here. And Gurion said, you're too out in the gate. If they want to come, I'm not going to stop them. I'm against religious coercion and anti, I'm against anti-religious coercion. Let everybody live the way they want to live. And so on and so forth. And in other words, the point is like this, as he puts it, uh, Okay? 
which means it wasn't, it was an attempt at a dialogue, it wasn't a dialogue. Because, and the reason is, for the same reason, if you want to be brutally frank about it, it's not possible to have a dialogue even today. Uh, it's a very politically un- incorrect thing I'm saying. I realize that, but nobody's looking. It's just you and me here. The, uh, the, 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 the fact is, the, no, the, 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 from the Orthodox and the Nazareth are coming from such different, uh, what shall I say, um, a set of assumptions that neither one can hear or acknowledge the other one's set of assumptions. And when you can't do that, you can't have a dialogue. You understand? It's a tragedy, but it's reality. So it's very politically incorrect. Nobody can go around saying it. And so and so, so we all lie. But nevertheless, that's what happens. But, but nevertheless, there, you know, the American Jewry, for example, and the other Jewry, it's, it's the absence of a dialogue. You see? It's one of the uh, uh, hallmarks, sad hallmarks, of modern Jewish history. Okay? And it didn't happen overnight, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it did happen. And as you see, Ben-Gurion discovered there's no common ground, and there's no violence, but complete subversive uh, business. Now, i got to tell you a story that I read the other day before I move on in a book I saw about uh, uh, Michael Barzo wrote a book, maybe you saw about the Israeli Special Forces or something like that. It brings into relief. I didn't bring the book with me, but do you all remember the 82 war in Lebanon? And I know most of you are too young to remember that. <laughs> the 82 war in Lebanon. And do you all remember there was a certain uh, point where Israel shot down 90 Syrian planes in five minutes. Right? It was a certain incident like that. That uh, the, the Israel invaded Lebanon, and then Syria sent uh, sand batteries, and by the time it's all over, the Gansa Syrian Air Force went and attacked Israel, and to their utter shock, they all got shot down in five minutes, six minutes. Uh, and, and Soviet Union, I remember, was shocked, and Ronald Reagan was shocked. You know, everybody, like, they all went, shot over the Middle East. What happened over there? And this guy describes it, it turns out, that the Weizmann Institute and all these math whizzes had the, the, worked out what we would call today some computerized program, and uh, which could uh, manage at the same time hundreds of aircraft and you know all that scientific stuff that I don't understand. And they're able to do it in such a way that nobody saw before that they're able to handle such a, a, a multi-valence battle and with amazing results. And I read the uh, story over here by the uh, commander Aviam Sella, who everyone became notorious for uh, recruiting Jonathan Pollard. And he said, yeah, there we were in the bore in the pit in Tel Aviv, which is the Air Force headquarters, the Army Air Force, the Defense Ministry. And uh, the main guy running the whole thing, right, so I'll never forget, so the main guy running the thing was a Hasidic guy from B'nai Brak named Moshe Krauss. I don't know the guy. And uh, sitting in Hasidic garb. This way he writes. I'm not... And, you know, he's one of these mass wizards, you know, like a Noam Alper type. You know, he just knew how to pre- pre- – we never went to college, never went to any school, just went to straight to yeshiva and just had a natural genius for this sort of thing. And he devised a program and he operated it. And so here's a guy that personally shot down the Syrian Air Force and, in five minutes. And then he's got to go back to B'nai Brock because he doesn't want to be late for Seder, you know. <laughs> and, he gets, and he gets on a bus – and, a, and it's in the middle of the Lebanon War. And an Israeli lady in the Tel Aviv bus on the way to Manbrak is screaming and says, you know, my son is in the army, and people like you contribute nothing to the national security. <laughs> and he answers, her, he says, it's not true. I learned Torah. <laughs> so the Israeli, you can't make that up, you know. So the Israeli, the Israeli reality, what can I tell you, in the religious sense, it's, it's kind of complex. By the late Ben-Gurion era, which is what we're looking at, 62 to 66, this unbridgeable gap, unbridgeable gap, is just accepted as part of the landscape. It meant that the Haredim will own a small number of areas in Israel, Mesharim, Geula, Bnei Brak, and that's it, the campus of the Shivot. Everything else will be Israelis, either secular or, or religious Zionist. That, 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 that was the reality of it. You know, everybody knows. If you want to see the ultra, go to Ben Sharim. You know, if you want to break you go to another neighborhood. The Mapai used its muscle to ensure that the masses of Sephardim would not en- enroll in the Haredi institutions. We talked about it last week. In the time of Eshkol and all that, you know, if you, and I know there are people here that can, can live through this. If you went to a Chinuch Atzmai school or Yeshiva, then your father could lose a job. You understand? You lose or, or you won't get a housing. They won't write you a little petek that you need, you know, for help for an operation or something. This is the way the system was run. But it's a festering wound on the body politic, on the hope for a universal patriotism. 
You're saying Israel will not be like other countries, normal countries, let's put it that way, in which everybody kind of subscribes, at least all the Jews. You know, with the Arabs, what do you want? It's never going to be that way. But you hope with the Jews, there'll be a universal patriotism because it's the only Jewish state. Not really, <laughs> right? There will always be some Jews, right, and a growing number, that will not subscribe to the Israeli patriotism, but will oppose it, as we just saw with the Chazanish, in principle, and regard it as a negative, or at least a bankrupt, a culturally, religiously, and intellectually bankrupt phenomenon. I'm talking about the state of Israel, my friends. And all this, of course, is the fruits of unilateralism, as I have tried to explain my best I could in previous years. You know, these guys have the attitude, we were here first and we were doing so, all of a sudden you just decided to go this direction, you decided to start the reform movement, you decided to start Zionism, you decided to, uh, you know, overthrow everything, you decided this, and we never agreed and we still don't, we never will. That's the way it goes. This radical gap in Hashkafa will find its cultural iconic representation in the last years of Ben-Gurion era, in Eifo Yasala, where's the, where's the Yasala affair, which rocked Israel in the early 60s. Now, there's a lot of mythology in the books and the accounts. No, they all lie. And only in the last five, six years has a lot of the truth come out. You understand? So, um, Israel Rel wrote a book that's full of baloney, and the, the, the lady wrote a book. It is, it is what it is. You know, in Israel, they, they always like to, to spice it. The case involved Breslov of Hasidim. You know what I said? Breslov of Hasidim. Breslov of like Chabad is one of the few groups held out under Stalin. That's right. Yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> she thought this is the breast of a Rebbe, you know. <laughs> I only look stupid. I'm actually smart. The, uh, <laughs> you know that Stalin crushed Judaism. I have to tell you. So who, who's the one that held out at Breslov and Chabad? I said we know this, and maybe a few others, but you know they're famous. So these guys are tough. When I say they held out. As you'll see before I finish my remarks tonight, they went through the Gulag Archipelago, they suffered the tortures, they did all the rest of it, and they're stark, you know, they wouldn't give in. These are amazing people, okay? Now, as a matter of fact, the name of the family here is Starkis. Right? The Starkis family, unbelie- uh, uh, unbelievably, but see, here's a guy who went, so the guy, Nachman Starkis, he was under Stalin, he was in the camps, okay? I want you, and, and these are people that did their doggone best to keep Shabbos in the camps. I mean, it's crazy. You understand? To keep kosher in the, in, in, in the Gula, in the Siberia. You, you're not talking about regular people over here. The Starkist family unbelievably received permission to make Ali in the early 50s. Isn't that amazing? I think in 53 or something like that, right, when Stalin died. So some Jews, not many obviously, it's only a trickle, were allowed to leave Russia and he went to Israel. There was a grandfather, Nachman Starkist, who had sons. The two sons were active Lubavitchers in London and in Israel. And there's a lot of crossover, but especially if you're in Russia, Brest of Chabad, you know, the whole point is to, keep, to be Jewish. And so there's a lot of cross-referencing, uh, so to speak. And so this is a guy who he himself is a, a Breslover. He, make, he moves to Meisharim. His sons are uh, Lubavitchers. Okay, the, again, the grandfather settles in Meisharim, which is, I mean, uh, from, he- from hell to heaven. Okay, here's a person from hell to heaven. He went from Stalin to Meisharim. So that, that itself is a, quite a story. And now a few years later, his, uh, he had a daughter, no, it was his sons were already out. He had a daughter who was married to some dude named Alter Schumacher, who got permission to make Aliyah. So, unbelievably, not only did the parents get out in 53, but in 57, the children, the last of the kids, got out. The couple had a son named Yasla, born in 52 in the Soviet Union, and they had a daughter. And they're not from, they weren't from back in Russia. That's what it was, you know, it was under Stalin's time. So the two boys were from, they came to Lubavitch, and the girl was not. And she married a guy, a regular Jewish, you know, just not religious. When the young people arrive, in, wrong people, the younger couple arrive in Israel, and it's 1957, you know, the, the, the poverty of Ben-Gurion era, they're unfamiliar with the country, they don't have anything. No, they get off the, 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 the plane, the boat, and what do you do? You know, until you find yourself. And they had two kids, they don't know where to find jobs, where to live. So for the moment, they do what you and I would do. They dump the kids with the grandparents. Don't your children do that? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> right? Okay, proud, happy, happy about that. So they dumped the kids. The, listen, the parents have an apartment in May Sharm. Apartment. In 57. Apartment. This, uh, you know, don't laugh. Okay? Got a sink. <laughs> you know? So the grandfather is glad to have an opportunity to stick some Yiddish guide in the grandchildren. They've been under Stalin. Okay? And meanwhile, and the girl goes to a Chabad, Beis Yaakov, I think it was Beis Rifka or something like that, and the boy to a Cheder, 
while the parents are looking, what kind of a job can he have? Where can he find an apartment? And so on and so forth. Like all the other Israelis who made Aliyah, nothing wrong with that. After some time, the parents finally decide to settle in Cholon. They get an apartment there, which was a secular town, especially in those days. They come to pick up their kids, the son and the daughter. The daughter they get, but not the son. Neighbors in Meisharin, and the mother's brother, who's Lubavitch, in other words, the boy's uncle, convinced the grandfather that the parents are disillusioned with life in Israel and want to go back to Russia. Okay? Which wasn't true. But that's got nothing to do with anything. Right? You know, they say, oh, they're going to take them and, and take them back to the Soviet Union. Now, this isn't true, but it will become a basic part of the rumor mill which accompanies the story. Okay? That they're saving a kid or they want to save a kid from fate worse than death which is go back to the Soviet Union. The grandfather, of course, is horrified. This kid has now been from Kino. He's going to go back to Russia. And encouraged by the neighbors, including the Natura Karta, which for those of you who don't know, knows that's the right to go to there against Israel, resolves to save the child from the child's evil parents from his own daughter. And I want to say this. Rishi Pesek Frank was not from the Natura Karta at all. He wasn't even exactly even a good artist. In other words, he was what you would call a normal guy, you know, politically, a great gone and so forth. He was in the last year of his life. And he, and he said, this is a terrible situation. Somebody has to save the child. Because the way he was told was, the parents are going to take him back to Russia. You, you understand? So this is the way it, it looked. So the boy is told. The boy is told. What is he, six? He says, your parents are coming to take you to a terrible place where you will suffer greatly. But don't worry. We will save you from their evil clutches. Just cooperate from us, and we will hide you from their evil hands. And the six-year-old boy cooperates. So in his mind, this is the uncle. The Lubavitcher, right? This is what he tells the nephew and the others do also. So in the mind of the kid, he's like Anne Frank. He gets his hiding from the Nazis. This is what the kid thought, and that's why he cooperates. Well, now, become, now begins a Haredi underground railroad experience. Because you're taking a kid away from the parents, you have to hide him. Where are you going to hide him? And so first they go to the Rishon, the Sion. You can see the play, right? The Rishon, and then, and then later back to Jerusalem, then to Tzvat, then to Bnei Brak, and finally to Koma Miut. Come here, if anybody remembers, it's a religious it's a kibbutz, uh, uh, Poli Aguda uh, kibbutz, which was famous that they keep Shemitah, back in the uh, Mendelssohn. Okay? So in other words, they take them to different places to keep them ahead of the authorities. Now, wherever they go, they find help. So what does that mean? This bespeaks a sharp Haredi disconnect from the Zionist narrative. The people don't say this is kidnapping even though by Israeli law it's kidnapping, Israeli law doesn't count. The state of Israel is a bunch of Kursim. This is a, a classic case in which they're trying to take a kid and ruin his neshama. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it's, I'm trying to show you, it's a completely different narrative. It coexists in the country at the same time, but this case will bring it into a sharp relief. Even if it hadn't happened, people would feel this way. But this case brings it into a very, very strong foreground. Uh, the angry parents... No, it's the boy's mother and father. Try to persuade and plead with the grandfather. Where is he? Tell us where he is. To no avail. He's not giving in. Because he's convinced that his daughter is lying. She married a non-from guy anyway. You know, she's no good. Right? And she won't let him stay here and so on and so forth. The parents go to the cops. And by the time the system works it through, the Israeli Supreme Court orders the grandfather to reveal, to reveal the boy's whereabouts or face imprisonment for contempt of court. <laughs> the grandfather said, Never. You're going to threaten me? I've been worked over by experts. <laughs> I've been through Siberia. Israel's going to threaten me? Are you kidding? This is a joke. You know, Ben Gurion's worst jail is, is, a, is, a, is a summer camp <laughs> by, by Star. You know that, right? He says, this is after I've been through that. And so they put him in jail for two years. Let me tell you something. He's in jail for two years. He gets three meals a day. No, I'm, I'm, you know, they, they, they don't know who they're dealing with. Well, they, you know, you get three meals a day. You get, you get the Dobbin. Probably they have a minion there. The truth, the truth is, the, the, the guards don't treat him bad. I mean, he's, he's an old man. He, he doesn't mean bad. In his, I'm going to tell you something. He wrote a letter to Ben Svi, the president of Israel. He said, I guess, you should give me a pardon. You know why? Don't you want, you want him to go back to Russia? This is against everything you stand for. No, he... There's a prisoner of conscience, so to speak. He doesn't see their way at all. I'm trying to show you. This case shows you the complete opposite spectrum, you know, the complete opposite way of looking at things on the part of the two parties. 
That's why it's such a wonderful case for analyzing that. Okay? And um, the police are angry. And so they launch a two-year national police manhunt in Israel. They look everywhere up and down. And in Israel, it's like France. There's one police department. There's not a bunch of different police departments. And so they, they this is Ben-Gurion's time. They, they pride themselves. They get their man. You know, in other words, they were, there's no Bill of Rights. Uh, there was no restraint on them uh, breaking that house. Or like that. They definitely should find them. No Yasala. Didn't, didn't, didn't happen. The cops traced the kid to Komamiyut, this very from Polia, go to uh, Moshav, Kibbutz, but they're too late, the boy's gone. They, know, they find that the family that hid him, and they arrest him, and they find the town rabbi, the Rav, who sanctioned the hiding, is also arrested, Rabbi Yamin Mendelssohn. I know this is probably a name that doesn't mean a lot to uh, many of you, but if you were my age and old enough, this was, a, they always used to talk about, that's the place that keeps the Shemitah, he was Mr. Shemitah. You understand? He was renowned throughout the world. As a matter of fact, I remember many years ago that when they first started keeping the Shemitah, they had like, like the Chumash said, they got a double crop the next year or the year before, the year before. And the Chazanish wrote to me, he said, should be Mepharsim this, you should publish this, because it says in the Torah, if you keep the Shemitah, you get a double crop the next year before. And they, the Israeli agriculture ministry gave them a certificate. They did indeed get it. So notice, this is a person not associated with wild extremism, like you find now the price tag in the West Bank or anything like that. Quite the opposite, you see? He's a mild-mannered guy who's mainly into Torah mitzvahs, and in this case, Shemitah, and so on and so forth. He's not somebody associated with violent breaking of the law. And indeed, it was, it was a whole mess, because he's a chashavarov, and his protest provokes protest, his arrest provokes protests from around the world, all these, you know, in all the magazines, from the Goda in America. In other words, you're, you're uh, imprisoning a chashav, a person who's, who's not really a criminal. You understand? And it was a mess. This is not what Ben-Gurion had in mind. Because uh, he's starting to look stupid. As the Yasala case, though, festers. So I'm talking about 1960, 61, 62. Uh, it brings to the fore latent tensions between the firm and the anti firm. You get it? Because it won't go away. And therefore, it aggravated, it acted as an irritant on intra Jewish, intra communal feelings over here. Because, after all, uh, what trumps? The right to save a kid from assimilation, which was the traditionalist view, rescuing him. Or the right of parents, which is the secular view, and the view of the whole Israel outside the Haredim. I mean, parents, for crying out loud, right? I mean, don't, 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 don't they have the, 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 the final disposition of the child? And it becomes clear that Haredim are not Goris to Medina in the liberal view it, it espouses. Because people see, that as far as the religion, the Haredim are concerned, they just don't see it like everybody else. They said, no, Yasal is right to me. Whoever took him is good. God bless him, and all the rest of it. The Chiloni society becomes increasingly enraged at the Haredim, and they started screaming at people in the street, kidnappers, fascists, barbarians, and it gets really rough at 61. By the time you get 61, all that, you know, they would you know, hit people in on the street, and all that, you bastards, tell what's going on. I'm talk very harsh over here. Got to be, a, you know, things like that. And so uh, it, it, it poisoned, it poisoned the atmosphere. If some people here will remember if you, if, if, if you were in Israel at that time. And it, be, it started becoming a rallying cry for a war on the Haredim. If you can take the law into your hands, if you don't have to acknowledge the law, why should we? Why can't we kill you? Why can't we burn down your institutions? What's against the law? You don't open the law. You understand? In other words, it called the fundamental, how should I say, grounding of the consensus, which is necessary for any civilized society, to be called into question. If you, know, if you talk to, say what you say, you don't hold from anything, so I don't have to hold from you. Why can't I smash your car? Why can't I do whatever I want? Why the heck are we funding you? Why are we allowing you to dodge the draft? And it got so bad that the regular rabbi said, I guess this is no good. The Moetzes Gedoli Torah, the head group of the Agoda, they said, Laman Hashem, return Yosso to the parents. I'll talk about the Pana Vishorov, the Shabir. These are famous Orthodox rabbis. Um, and, you know, they, they, they had a lot of, uh, you'd think that they had a lot of influence. Uh, the Pana Vishorov, of course, is associated with, uh, with, notice these guys come from a different approach. There's the Rav Kahneman, the Panovich Rav with Gorin and a bunch of army officers taking the Panovich to give him a day of the Yarchi Kala, try to expose him. That's a different approach. <laughs> you understand? Know we don't need this. What's going over here? However, when there are no responses from the kidnappers, so the public starts to understand, Shema Mino, it's not a Torah It's Lubavitch or those groups, because they don't listen to your good rabbis. 
You see? In other words, when big Rabbanim came out and said, she give him back, and nobody listens. So you see over here, it's not from the group that listens to those types. It's, it's, this, he's a sellout. Rabbi Levin from the Agudo, the, the Itchamayar Levin was the Agudo representative. He's like Uncle Tom. You know, to these people. You know, they take money from the government, they support Ben-Gurion, all the rest of it. It's, it's uh, you know, a matter of who your creds are. And so tension builds in Israel, and it might turn into a civil war, just at the peak of the threat from Nasser. This is what we talked about last week, right? With the, uh, or two weeks ago, with the uh, missiles and the German scientists and all that stuff. This is exactly when this is happening in Israel, naturally. Okay? So little by little, it becomes clear to the cops that the Haredim have, and in this case, the Natura Karta types, but the ones that don't listen to Agudah, have smuggled Yossel out of the country despite the Mapai police state. This is what really because they used to control the airport, who goes in, who goes out. And like I say, there's no personal rights. Some people will remember Israel in those good old days. They really give you a hard time at the airport and at the, uh, at the uh, it, it, what's that? It still is. Not like it was. Not like it was. You, you know that. I mean, not like it was, you know. They, they used to, oh boy. Anyway, how'd they get, the, how'd they get them out? How'd they do it? And basically, if they did it, it's a certain way of saying, jump in a lake, I'll be polite. Jump in a lake to the state. So, uh, clearly, one man's kidnappers is another person's Scarlet Pimpernel. That's what's happening over here. Right? This is my mother's heartthrob. <laughs> in Czechoslovakia in 1935. The, uh, the, no, but was he, remember Scarlet Pimpernel? He was a hero. He was saving people from the cops. Sure, he's saving from the guillotine from the bad government. So, one person's kidnappers is another person's Scarlet Pimpernel. In March of 1962... In March of 1962, in the middle of the whole Flash Gordon thing that we talked about last week, when Israel's freaking out over death rays and who knows what, Ben-Gurion gets involved. He says, the threat to the fabric of the society is too great. Okay? And he says, we have to find Yasser at all costs. And so it's become an existential crisis, and he calls in the Mossad. Uh, Israel, who was, in those days, the Mamuneh, he was in charge of the FBI and the CIA. No, he was in charge of everything. So the, 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 this decentralized police power, which is absolutely characteristic of the Ben-Gurion estate. And so you're going to have like a, a kind of a Jewish version of the Day of the Jackal or something like that, in which it's the government with all of its uh, resources versus the ingenuity of the uh, individual perpetrator. And that's what makes it a fascinating story. Ben-Gurion tells this around this is an existential crisis. And anyway, you found Eichmann. If you found Eichmann, you ought to be able to find a kid. You understand? And this Israel took it, took it real uh, personal, and he said, the Mounties always get their man, you know what they say? And this Israel says, we're going to do it. Right? This is, so it becomes a certain obsession with him. We're going to make this happen. Now, I want to be clear about this. They did do it, and it didn't take them long. This went from March 10th, 1962, to July 1st, 1962. They found him less than three months. Okay, so they're good. You get what I'm saying? When they, when they put their mind to it, they, it's not like it went on for years. All right? Now, um, how this happened, uh, the number two at the Mossad, Tzvi Aroni, he said, uh, he's over there. See, Aroni, these are the guys that were, the, the, they look like schleppers. They weren't schleppers. Each one could kill you, you know. Uh, this is the Mossad. Uh, he said, this is a misuse of the, uh, of the resources. We have to watch Nasser. We have to watch the Russians. We have to watch the Palestinians. We ain't got time to run after some Hasidic kid and someone else. And Ben-Gurion, this is no Ben-Gurion. It's my call. And the Rosh I'm giving the orders, not you, and I say this is important. I'm not interested in your opinion, it's my opinion, and we're going to do it. And so he still had that power, you know, Ben Gurion, and so they did it. So Sir Arel flies to Europe, and he assembles all his agents, and basically drop everything. Hear that? Drop everything, and find Yasala. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a that, that's what, so I want you to understand. Stop, uh, which I bugging the Egyptian embassy in Vienna. Stop following this double agent in Rome. Stop doing the thing and in, 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 you know, forget the German scientists for a while. Yasala. So, the, okay, you know. Uh, logically, uh, the target is groups to the right of the good, as I said before. And so in America, that would be Satmar and Lubavitch, for example, right? These were to the right of the, I'll say it again, right of the good, especially in those years, Lubavitch was anti Israel. Now, he was in the process of changing. But it was, it was, he did change. But, but in those years, those who were Lubavitch, know I'm talking about, those years were very anti, uh, you know, Zionists, all the rest of it. And they, as I say before, they don't care about no more. It's Gedoli Atar over here. Uh, in Europe, the Mossad discovers a whole subculture they never knew about. 
I don't think most of us do unless you're European. We have some Europeans in the audience. Most of us don't know. There's Antwerp, there's Strasbourg, there's London, there's Switzerland. We in Baltimore and places like that, we don't know from this stuff. We've heard of Israel. We've heard of B'nai Brock. We've heard of places in America like Lakewood and Muncie and Baltimore. You know, you, who, who knows about Ex-Laban and, 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 those, and then the Europeans do, but we don't. And uh, this is Ramosha Salvation. Nobody knows it. You saw Moshe Salvation. They think it's the father of J.B. Salvation. This is Ramosha Salvation of Zurich, okay, which was, a, they, they had a yeshiva in Lugano and then in Lucerne. These are people who found themselves different, his Briskorov's uh, hmm, grandson, and it's a salvation, you know. And uh, what do you call it? They found themselves in 1939, at the beginning of the Holocaust in Switzerland, to their good mazel. One of them was Rabbi Aaron Lane Steinman, for example. And uh, they're the right place and the right time. And they settled down in the Mickey Shivas and learning circles and all these kind of places, especially when the Holocaust is over. Here's a whole tale of a subculture that I wish I had the time to do justice to, but I don't tonight of, as I say, a whole different little set of movements uh, of a very strong, shall I say, ultra-Orthodox vibrancy in Europe and a time when European Jewry is, is in general uh, collapsing. Maybe I'll, I'll find time later this, uh, this uh, semester to get into that. Um, but let's put it this way. Yasa is probably among all these places, and he was, because in that time that I'm talking about, in 1962, there's very big uh, sympathy and support for the Tour Carta. You know what I said? Uh, more than today, I would say. Uh, but at that time, for sure. Quite anti-Zionist, hard to pre- penetrate, but like Jews, a big blabbermouth. And so they start to pick up a trail. You know, they start, you sit back at a shoal, you sit here, you sit there, go, go, go hang around the kosher restaurants, pretty, you know, people yak, you know how it goes, and uh, bushes in Bar Park, as they say. And uh, they start to pick up a trail of a woman who might be the key to the, the whole thing, Maybe. Now, here we come into a remarkable tale of Madeleine Farai, who's a French woman, not Jewish, born in Calais in 1920, marries a Gentile in 1939, has a son named Claude, gets divorced in 1942. She's a successful businesswoman. She participates in the French resistance. And the war's over. She's not Jewish at all. But she's a spiritual seeker. That's her nature. Unusual. And, uh, you know, not everybody's like, her parents, by the way, are socialist, they're a Marxist, they have no time for religion, she writes this, and when she talks to the local priest, and she's not in any satisfaction, she's somebody who's really looking, okay, which is uh, rare, that is one in France, you know, but it's like that, and it's hard to get married when you're that type, right, hard to get married, because outside of the non-Jewish world, as well as the Jewish world. The struggle for Israel in 1948 to 45, 48 captures her imagination, is this the Bible coming true? She visits Israel as a Gentile in 1949. That's very unusual. And she becomes an ardent Zionist. She, conver- she finally comes back to France and makes the big step. She converts to Judaism in 1950. But reform, which is not a popular thing in French Jewry, because reform is very, is very tiny. Okay? Uh, again, we're not mostly familiar with this, but in Europe... Uh, the reform movement never really took off the way people imagined. But what happened was that the orthodox groups um, modified, moved to the left, shall we say, uh, to accommodate the Balabat, so it's the United Synagogue in England, similar things in France. To this day, in France and Italy and Holland and England, there are local rabbinical schools which graduate local rabbi for local communities, and they've never stopped being orthodox, although they've always been very, very modern. And uh, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, and, uh, like I said, I'm not, I can't do justice to now. Uh, but in France, that's absolutely what happened. The reform movement never took off. So the overwhelming majority of Jews in France are just not observant. You know, they're assimilated, but they're not reformed. So when she starts introducing herself as somebody Jewish, most of the Jews say, you're not Jewish, you know. So she said, oh, I didn't know that. And so in 1951, she converts Orthodox. Okay? Uh, with her son. And she comes to Shammah Shabbos. So we're dealing here with what we call a Gertzedek. And the reason I say Gertzedek, many people don't know what I'm talking about, but there's like three levels of Gerus. Uh, it's a Gertzedek and a Ger, and then what I always call, uh, because we don't know what to do with it. Right? <laughs> and a Ger, and a Ger, my students all make fun of me. He said, the, the Gertzedek is like Ruth. You understand? A spiritual thing. You know, so they were looking for what the truth, and they found it. 
you know, with no ulterior motive whatsoever. This is a very high madrega. We mention them in the davening all the time. Al a place of rim, right? The ger is a very high level. And then there's something called a ger, which is almost always the result of marriage. There's ulterior motive. And whatever it says in the books, by the time it's all over, if the person who converts really keeps the religion, fine, they're as Jewish as you and I. You understand? We would perhaps prefer that Jewish boy marry Jewish girl, Jewish boy met, met Jewish girl, Jewish girl met Jewish boy, but it happened. And, uh, and it happens. And if the partner who converts says, I'm going to be Shomer Shabbos and all the rest, and they mean it, then they're just as Jewish as anybody else. And then there's a third level going, uh, because, you know, they, are you going to keep anything? Uh, not real. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The husband doesn't keep anything. And so what are they doing it for? And then and they don't mean it. And they say to keep the missing. They don't keep the missing. And then, then this is the big problem we have today. What, what do you do with them? You understand? Know this one says they're Jewish. This one says they're not Jewish. You have all the problems. But the lady I'm speaking over here, without question, is an outstanding example of category A. Because she didn't meet anybody all the rest of it. She really was looking in her life for a spiritual home, for finding God. Let's be very direct about it. In her case, she found it in Judaism. And as we'll see, she even moved farther and farther to write it, she went on. Uh, she becomes, in the early 50s, a part of a fascinating, unique uh, French-Jewish term, Der Heretz movement, that none of us, if we're not French, know what I'm talking about. These are names I don't think you've... Maybe you've heard of Levinas, but you haven't heard of Andre Nair and Leon Ashkenazi. Leon Ashkenazi. These are... How should I put it? These are uh, French Jews with an excellent secular education, and they're also passionately interested in Jewish, and this one learned a little more, this one learned a little less, and they really wrapped up in their Judaism, including the Gemara and all the rest of it, and they tried to mix together in the French way, not in the German way, kind of a turn der Herz, which is highly eclectic and intellectual, and uh, it's really remarkable. You know, uh, I still remember many years, nobody, like I said, if you're not from European, you don't know, you know what I'm talking about. But if you are European, you do know what I'm talking about. I remember a million years ago, I was once on a date in Israel with a, with a French girl, in Israel, you know, a million years ago. A uh, million and a half. <laughs> What's that? You're not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> she said, no, wait a second. And, uh, but I said, and I remember when a girl from Strasbourg, and I, she said, oh, they're having a shear or something that week. What's, what's the shear? Uh, the Maharal and Proust. Okay? Now, believe me, those who heard of the Maharal never heard of Proust, and those who heard of the Proust never heard of the Maharal. <laughs> You understand? No, but it's, 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 it's very, very typical of the. Uh, a, a, it's a fascinating kind of a thing in these areas. In Baltimore, it ain't going to happen. Don't worry, you're safe. The, uh, the, the, the point is so she becomes part of this intellectualist, Jewish, Orthodox, modern Orthodox circle. And as a matter of fact, uh, Leon Ashkenazi becomes very big. We don't read French and French or Jewish books about Judaism. There's a ton of them. And he's like the big guru. They call him Manitou, the Great Spirit. Uh, she converts him to Zionism, believe it or not, to religious Zionism. So she was, you know, starker religious Zionism than him. But listen, she's what, 31? I don't blame her. She wants to get married. I don't blame her. She meets a young, unmarried French rabbi, you know, a modern Orthodox French rabbi. They date, but in the end, his family's going to raise hell if he marries a Gilras. Now, it's not right, because she's a Gerdsetic. But it's not right. But on the other hand, it happens. It's after all, it's right after the Holocaust. Uh, only one person speaks out for her. Ironically, a super for me. Right? Uh, Rabbi uh, Avram Mises, you know, I think these names don't mean anything to you. He will become the head of the Torah Karta. You have no idea who the people we're dealing with over here. Rabbi Mises grew up in Russia, uh, like 1901, something like that. His parents died when he was, when he was a baby. He lived off of bread from the street. He became very from. He learns, I don't know, in, in Slutsk Yeshiva. Communism takes over. Uh, he doesn't care. I, 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 I'm going to read you. I mean, he will run a Yeshiva in, in Minsk in the 1920s on the Communist called the Yeshiva Mesiris Nefesh. And they don't mean that as a cliche. You understand? It's Stalin. It's Mesiris Nefesh. Give up your life. I want to read you this little thing I pulled from the, just the internet, the, the, the Wikipedia, what it says about it. Listen to this. Um, he was arrested a bunch of times. 
what do you call it? Himshich Shom Shah Esther Shah. He eventually was under Stalin. In, in, um, he kept doing what he wanted to do, and he went to Stalin in Siberia for 10 years. Shamar Shabbat. In Stalin's gulag. Hinech Tfilin. She Slich I don't know how the heck you get Tfilin in this sort of thing. For Yashab Besukha She Banab Abor Mechusa Beschach. You see, he, said, he, he made himself a sukkah in Siberia from branches in, in a pit. The uh, NKVD, you know, the, the guards found him and beat him up. He wouldn't leave the sukkah. I said, it's a miracle they didn't shoot him. It's unbelievable. He would, to, to go to the, to Teuvel, which a man doesn't even have to do, he would break the ice in Siberia and go to Teuvel. So who are you talking about? You're talking about like this. And right after the war, he was able to get out of Russia, and he's part of the yeshiva movement that tries to build little yeshivas, at least, in France after the war. And a person like this is very spiritual. And so he goes, Gerrit Sedek, what's the problem? So it's ironic. In her big crisis, the modern Orthodox act racist, and the ultra-Orthodox act anti-racist. This is obviously, in my opinion, a formative influence. In 1954, she moves to... You can't make this up. In 1954, she moves to Israel because she wants to get married. She brings her son, Claude, and puts him in Kibbutz Yavne, and then the be KBY, like the high school. This is when KBY is just starting, Karen Yavne. He is not Claude anymore, he's Uriel. Okay? Now, you understand, the mother was a convert, and the son, she slept him along. So he's a convert also. Uh, he's not as uh, stark as she is, but nevertheless, he does it. Uh, she doesn't find a shidduch. She moves back to France. Her son's in yeshiva, in KBY. She moved back to France in the mid-50s, but instead of that uh, modern Orthodox Marcel uh, Maral Proust, the gang, she starts hanging around a different set of people, the yeshiva world of ex I don't think anybody even knows what I'm talking about. Look over here. Here's Lake Geneva, and one end is Zurich, and the other end is in France, another resort, ex On the way is Montreux and uh, Geneva, very classy area of Europe, very beautiful area of Europe. Uh, in 19, here's a tale. I'll just give you a little bit. Uh, you know, long ago, smart people realized something that people either like or don't like, and that is, there's no survival in Judaism without yeshivas. That's what we discovered in the, in the 20th century, 19th, 20th century. There, no, there is no other tactic that will work. All the others sooner or later fail. It's just, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear it, but it's what it is. And... Um, uh, therefore, there was a movement, sort of spontaneous, in different places, particularly in the 20th century, to set up yeshivas in different places. Uh, some worked and some didn't work. And uh, there was a uh, Rabbi Weil, Ernest Weil, who, uh, in Alsace. Alsace is a place of very long-standing, st- old traditionalist Ju- Judaism. I mean, many became known from the modern era, but many stayed. And uh, this is a place that switched from France to Germany, right? used to be part of France, then it was under Bismarck in Germany, and he grew up, in, he was born in 1868, so he grew up under Germany, and because of that, Ernest Weil, he went to the Hildesheimer Seminary, the really from guy was a rabbi in many communities in Alsace, in the area of Strasbourg, and uh, after he was rabbi for decades, he finally achieved his goal, he was very uh, active with the youth, he was a very charismatic individual, and, uh, and he, 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 he made yeshiva near Strasbourg in a small town, and he got Simcha Wasserman, the son of Bochano Wasserman, to be the head. And they started to get guys together because he said, this is, this is the only way Judaism will survive in France, that's for sure, called Yeshiva Chachmei Sarfas. Uh, Simcha Wasserman moves to America in the late 30s. And so they bring in Rabbi Chaikin. Again, these are well-known names in Europe, not here, who was a student of the Chavetz Chaim. And they want to make a Yeshiva. The war, World War II breaks out. This is Europe. So the Russian Yeshivas are drafted in the French Foreign Legion, believe it or not. And... Uh, <laughs> That's a movie, Bojas, you know. Uh, but anyhow, the, the, uh, the war's over. And when the war's over, the Holocaust is over. And you have all these uh, refugees in France. And nearby is Dachau and Buchenwald and all that. And there were some spiritual heroes that tried, uh, Mordechai Pogromansky and people like that, to make little yeshivas to be collate, to bring this up, uh, the, whatever they can save, the Sheretz plate of the Sheretz plate if I can use that term. And they want to revive this yeshiva that uh, fell apart because of the Holocaust, and they bring it to aix les which is a resort in, in, the, in the middle of France, on the Swiss border, as you can see, on Lake, uh, Ge- on Lake uh, Geneva. 
So in other words, here's a little episode that nobody knows about. It, and it's successful. I think it's still there, I believe. And uh, all, uh, very, uh, what should I put it this way? They sympathize with the Torah Karta. Right? The very, from, this is not an attempt, as I say, to marry a Proust and a Maral, to help a Proust. You know? uh, not that he's a god, because he's a Jew, but nevertheless, down with him. And uh, very right-wing sort of place. She loves it. That's the point. Isn't that interesting? No, she's on a spiritual journey and she ain't finished yet. She didn't find, she, she is introduced to the she world, she laps it up. She would love to get married and live in a place like that, like you say today, you know, in some yeshiva community and all the rest of it, but it doesn't happen quite yet. So this is quite a story. All right? Uh, she calls herself Ruth Ben David, Ruth Ben David. So she got the son in KBY and the mother's moving to the right wing of the Agoda and even beyond the Agoda. So there's a mother and a son, but they're uh, hashkaf wise in different places. In 1959, the son wants to enlist in Sahal in the IDF. Uh, she doesn't like that at all, because by this time, she's beyond the Agudah. So she says, talk to Rabbi Mises, because he's a friend of ours. And so here you have the son. <laughs> he goes from KBY. Himself is a friend, convert from, French, <laughs> from France. And he goes to talk to the head of the, uh, the Torah Karta. What should I do? My mother told me to talk to you. Rabbi Mises says, if I try to tell this guy to, to dump these really, he's not going to list, stay one more year in the yeshiva. That's what he says. You know, that's what you should do. And by the way, if you're looking for activities, I, can, I want to sign you up for the Scarlet Pimpernels. Okay? Because we get, we're moving Yussel around to save the boy from fate worse than death. They want to send him back to Russia. And this Rabbi Mises takes this French guy, who wasn't even Jewish originally, from KBY and says, you want to join our group? And he does. Okay? The police search gets more thorough in 1960, at the time when this is happening. So Rabbi Mises, who obviously, if he survived, Stalin was an inventive person, he gets the idea of smuggling Yosel out of the country. But how are you going to do that? It's the Mapai state. Like you say, it's the, you know, they have border controls, and very strict border controls. How can you do it? Who can do it? Talking to the son, to Uriel, he said, wait a minute, I remember your mother from France. You know, I tried to get her married over there. She's a French citizen, she has a Galicia passport, and she knows Europe like the back of her hand, and she's a very smart person. Oriol talks to his mother, and he said, you know, this will definitely help you with Shaduchim in the Haredi world. <laughs> <laughs> and for her part, she was very close with this Rabbi Mises, who had backed her before. And so Oriol says, she, so she flies to Israel to join her son, the son gets a hold of Yasla, he dyes the hair, he dresses himself up, dress up the boy's a girl, they give him a, a forged passport. In other words, the son forges a passport. You learn a lot of things in yeshivas, you know. <laughs> and, they, and they successfully exfiltrate mother and child out of the country. Right? It's amazing. They get him through because the guards wouldn't think this is, it's like a movie, you know. They travel to Europe. First to Exleban, then to Switzerland, then to Antwerp, getting all kinds of underground support. Because whenever you go to these communities, especially the type that I just described, they're helping. No, they see it as a mitzvah. You understand? For a while, Yasla, for example, is enrolled in the Cheder in Lucerne, which is under Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik. He originally had Yeshiva in Lugano. Uh, again, these are you know, small, very intense Yeshiva environment, and they ain't talking to nobody. Haredi rabbis, of the type I'm talking about, praise the mother for her efforts. I'm talking about the Ruth, the, 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 the French lady. And meanwhile, the state of Israel is freaking out. Okay? Now, uh, eventually, she smuggles the Oslo, but going to get to, the, 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 to a hot, uh, dressed as a girl into the United States of America. Gets it by the customs in this country. Uh, first, she goes to uh, Vineland, New Jersey. And then I just found this out yesterday. And then to Philly, to our own Rabbi Eisman. Okay, because, he, because the other one called him, he said, I have a guy over here, and this is a mitzvah, and we need somebody to help out over here. And they take him in. He said he was dressed like a girl, and he helped her. But after a couple of days, uh, Rabbi Eisman said, I guess, is this really right? He asked the Rosh Hashivas in Philly. And they say, they say you should ask for Baron Cutler. Uh, and he tells the lady, I'm going to ask Baron Cutler. Baron Cutler is a dangerous left winger to her. <laughs> you understand that? That's in the Aguda. They want to give him back. So she says, thank you very much. She comes right away. He takes the girl, the boy, and uh, disappears. Eventually, they end up in Satmar in Williamsburg. Okay? So this is quite remarkable. Um, the Satmar Rebbe plays him with a trusted family. After all, he's got no problem with this whatsoever. 
Right? Uh, smuggling Jews, I want you to understand, from um, police is an old Jewish practice. You had to do it all the time in Europe. My mother grew up in a small town, Bardiov, in Slovakia, and she told me that when she was a little girl, there was a, they used to, old, old people would say like this, if you go to the shul in the middle of the night, it's a, it's a ghost. It's Mason with Talisha. And they have a whole minion, and they do Yamod, and so on and so forth. They freaked her out, and they gave her nightmares, and things like this. When she grew up, she discovered that they used to tell this to the kids, because they used to smuggle in refugees to hide them in the shul. They didn't want the kids to come and look and tell. So you don't understand what the Eastern European culture was. So you tell me you're going to take somebody and you know, now you and I are Americans. You say, what do you have to hide in America for? The Saddam Rebbe is not even a question. You know, the evil Ben Gurion is like Robespierre. This is Scarlet Pimpernel. So anyhow, uh, the Mossad is hot on the trail by 1962. They suspect Satmer because that's an obvious uh, thing. And so uh, Issa Harel calls J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> and he says, you know, make a search. And they search the summer camps, Camp Aguda, uh, Camp Chamberlain, all these type of places, the usual suspects. So it's a wonderful, if I had time, I would say Diego Hoover and underneath, Afo Yasala, you know, because the FBI comes looking with a very poor description of who it is. I mean, they went to Camp Aguda, you know, and, and these kind of places. And are you hiding any kid over here and all the rest of it? Now, uh, after a lot of dead ends, a lot of dead ends in Antwerp, the most out here is about this remarkable French Gioris. And if you're Israel, you start to say click, click, click. You start to put two and two together and say that she must be involved. But how? He's trying to figure out how. Meanwhile, the story switches back to Israel. Uriel, the son, is experiencing a late teen Frumkite crisis. It happens. Not in Baltimore, of course, but it happens. He travels to, so he's got a French passport. He travels to Lebanon and Jordan on the French passport. This brings him to the attention of the Shin Bet. What's that all about? And the head of the Shin Bet, Amos Manor, you know, wants to investigate him. Is he an enemy agent? They thought he's connected with telling one Eli Cohn. I know that. Now, then they find out that it's not, that it's not true. They just have a, a, a weirdo on their hands. So then, Uriel, when he comes back, is drafted in the army, in the, in the Israeli army. The Shin Bet, though, is aware now of his existence and his biography. It's mid-1962. As a soldier, it's standard operating procedure in the Tzahal that any letters you send overseas are read by the censor. Right? That's normal. In this case, the letters are to his mother in France. They notice. You know, one letter is to a place in Switzerland. Another place is in Marseille. Another place is... It's most unusual. You get it? Uh, at different addresses. This arouses the notice of the censor. There are even a few references. How's the boy? And so the censor doesn't know what to do. He passes it to the Shin Bet. The Shin Bet passes it to the Mamuneh, to Israel. And it's a click, 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 ding, ding, ding. Right, he starts to put it together. Uh, through these letters, uh, the woman, Ruth Ben David, is located and watched. Now begins like a Jean Le Carre movie. You know, they, they, they follow her, they trace her, this, that, and the other. And she went in one place as a blonde and came in as a brunette, you know, all that sort of thing. She says, very good. And uh, uh, the Mossad agents knows that she, notice that she's a cool and calculated customer. A plan is devised. She owned property. She was selling a piece of property. Uh, she sells property to a guy. The guy says, I'll pay you, you know, a good price. Let's go to the lawyer. They go to the lawyer. The lawyer's house is really a Mossad. She walks in the house, and it's like a movie. And they lock the doors and say, you're now under control of the Mossad. There they go. She will not talk. They, they interrogate her. She won't talk. What are you going to do? Amos Manor, meaning the head of the Shin Bet in Israel, calls in the son. Confess. You are destroying the state of Israel. You're in the Tzahal. So you're not crazy like your mother. You don't want to destroy Israel. Right? We're not trying to do nothing bad. No legal action will be taken against you or against your mother. We just want the boy. Okay? Uriel spills the beans. The news is flashed this, Harrell in the Paris house with the mother. Right? The whole confession. This Harrell tells the mother her son is blabbed. She says, I don't believe it. And if it is, he's not my son. But eventually she believes it. What happens next is not exactly clear. Either she breaks down and tells where the kid is, or she claims that she didn't break down, but some other chassid blabbed on it, which is also totally possible. Either way, Israel finds out where the kid is. In the United States of America, in Manhattan, uh, in New York, I mean. Israel calls Ben-Gurion, 
Ben Gurion calls the Israeli Attorney General. The Israeli Attorney General calls the American Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. Maybe you've heard of him. <laughs> Bobby Kennedy says, like "Okay, we're going to bring in the feds and we're going to raid this place." But the head of the FBI in New York says, "Like this, it's New York. Uh, it's Saturday morning. Wait till Shabbos over. Just take it from me. <laughs> this, you don't need this in the paper. It's a few months before the congressional elections. We don't need this." And so they wait until Havdalah, and then they raid 126 Penn Street in Williamsburg. Okay, anybody live there? Uh, and sure enough, the kids there, they say, where's his papers and all the rest of it, and they find it. He also is then flown to Israel. There it is. He wasn't mistreated. That's the grandfather. Are you happy you're in Israel? Yeah. It's the mother. It's the father. In other words, from the point of view of the Israeli news, happy ending. That's my point. But since there's a cultural chasm over here, the different reactions to the return reflect that chasm separating the Haredim from the other Israelis. Right? One group is happy, the other group is sad. Yasselah grows up to be a Chiloni Masorati, as you would say today. And he lives in Israel. Um, even though Satmar brainwashed him as a kid, turns out when you're dealing with a kid, it's more like a light rinse. And so Kabbalah, Kabbalah Kach Palto, you know, whatever came in, it came out, it changed with it. Within a year, let's put it this way, one year later he was in public school. You see? Uh, and because we live in the age, my friends, of the internet, uh, so we have surreal uh, phenomena. I found, this is also speaking, in fact, uh, on behalf of Shabbat now, like to keep in South Africa, everybody should do Shabbat. Hi, my name is Yossi Shukmacher. Probably you know me from my history uh, yesterday. I just met uh, the Rabbi Benyak ben Zion, Platzko. Uh, and he showed me the, the site, Shabbat.com. I was amazed. It's a huge, effective tool to bring in all sorts of people, Jew, Judaism, to bring them together and to listen, to see each other, and just maybe to come, to come more, more friendly, more friendly, more to understand each other. And that's what I believe, that we, as a Jews of the world, can change things by just being united and bringing all kinds of people, all kinds of ideas, just bring them together and talk about it. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. And see you on Shabbat.com. So if I was politically correct, I would end right here, but I have a little bit more to go to, 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 to bring out all the uh, dirt. Historians will tell you, and they're not wrong necessarily, that Yas will help take down Israel and Ben-Gurion. Because since they had to take so many people off of this, they weren't watching the spies, the German, the German scientists. Therefore, there was a whole misunderstanding what that was. And Ben-Gurion fired Israel, and then later on, Ben-Gurion quit. And part of the reason, it's true, is because of the misuse, shall we say, uh, I'm talking about from a Bitchonid point of view. The misuse of the Mossad that they, you can't take your eyes off the other guy. So that's part of it. Interestingly, Yussel also kind of took down the Tor Karto. Now, how did he do that? Uh, she still wants to get married. She was like 44, 45 years old. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the lady, hold on. She still wants to get married. Uh, at that time, I mean, who are you going to marry at 45 years old? So there aren't that many single guys that if they are, why are they single? In Me'a Sharim, in America you could hear, in Me'a Sharim it doesn't happen. So, as a widower. So, how many people, it so happens that a lot of the big rabbis at that time, the, the wives died. And so a question like this, the son, Uriel, he's the shachan, can you believe? He's like, this, I, would, I would like to get my, my mother would like to get married. By this time, she is so far to the right, she would love to be the representative of the Torah Karta. You get what I'm saying? She started in French Catholic, but she, she no, the, the, she's obviously finds in this tremendous spirituality. 
I'm not saying what you do. I'm talking what she did, right? She went, and, and, you, and it doesn't, and she's you know, shaving the head and all this. She's, it's fine. You get it? She, all this is, she finds tremendous spirituality. Uh, so she's an eligible female. And uh, what do you call it? There are no, a number of these rabbis, some of the big shots, their wives that died within the last year, year, year and a half, including uh, Rabdo Sokolowski and uh, Rabbi Jungreis and uh, Rabbi Amar Blau. Now, uh, these are all famous names in the, in the Torah card that were not necessarily in Baltimore. Uh, Rabbi Sokolowski, who was like, um, Mises had just died in 61. And so Sokolowski was the one who, who took up her cause. And he said, I want to make a shidduch, because we want to do everything honorably, with you and Amram Blau, who was the head of the Torah Karta. Okay, Amram Blau was 25 years older than her. And he said, I'm sure she's not going to marry me. And she says, I'm willing if you're willing. And so, after thinking about it for a while, he says, then I, then I, I propose to you that we should get married. All hell breaks loose, because he has 10 kids. Four boys and six girls. The mother had died 11 months earlier. So the Israeli papers have a field day. This is a scandal. You understand? He's marrying a Gioris, and she's a French woman, and by the time the Israeli papers get finished with it, she was a cabaret dancer. You know? <laughs> she, I'm telling you. She, she blew up the, 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 the German uh, nightclubs, and there's all kinds of stuff. You know, listen, Mariv, Haaretz, it doesn't get better than him. You know, there was, it, was, it, was, it was a, what do you call it, feeding frenzy, you know? And uh, uh, what he called his children, so I guess this is a, a, a big piece, it's beneath your dignity. Rabbi Sokolovsky says, why is it beneath your dignity? She's a geared ascetic. There's nothing wrong with this in the world. It's not like he married some girl, and then she wasn't Jewish, he wants to convert or something. She's a geared ascetic, and not only a geared ascetic, even by the Torah character standards, she's, she's a hero. You know, so they know she's really, she's genuinely from, you can't deny that, you see? And so what you have is a clash of sensibilities, and uh, they do get married, but all hell broke loose. As you can see over here, they turned from a controversial couple to, uh, uh, and it was all over the papers, and his kids, uh, what shall I say, uh, broke off all relations with him. And uh, Rabbi Sokolovsky performed the wedding in Bnei Brak because they couldn't get married in Israel. In Yerushalayim, he got exiled, so to speak, to Bnei Brak. And like I say, this really messed up the, uh, the Torah Karta. You see, because they spent two, three years on this scandal. And they had to leave town. And so he, <laughs> it's a little bit, Lahavdal, Elif Avdalas, it's a little bit like the Prince of Wales and, and Wallace Simpson, right? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> and Nusach Natura Karta, he gave it all up for the woman he loved because he had a big position in that world. And he did give it up. It's, it's, you know, I mean, it sounds funny to us to even think of romance within the context of the Natura Karta, Mayor Sharm al but I'm wrong. Like I say, you can't make it up. I'm wrong. And so he married her, I'll say, and I'll say it for a fourth time. He said, and, and what's the problem? She's a geared ascetic. You understand? She's a geared ascetic. So anyhow, uh, I suppose she was worth it. So she becomes the ultra orthodox Helen of Troy. <laughs> the face that launched a thousand Gemaras. The, uh, right? She, she outlived him. She, didn't, I, I mean, she used to come to Baltimore, by the way. Because it was, uh, years later... You know, he, 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 got, he got a, okay. He, I, I know people remember, he used to say, by Chazenbaum, if that means anything. They, uh, I remember for years ago, wait a second, in, the, in, in later years, you know, what she did was she was, she was in the Natura Carta. He came back. It wasn't the same Natura Carta before, but she had a French passport. And if she wanted to, she could take a French identity. And she used to try to see if there are Jews in the Arab country that she can rescue because. She has a French background. And I remember once, I wasn't able to find it, but I do remember once in Begin's time that there was one case where the, uh, you know, the Arabs had a Jewish, uh, somebody, uh, uh, Shavui, you know, a thing, and nothing worked. And, but, but she went to Arafat because she was from the Tur Karta, and she got him out. You understand? And the Begin said, like, thank you to somebody. She said, I wouldn't even talk to you, you know. But, uh, but, but like I say, uh, this, to conclude... What does this uh, case show us? It shows us that uh, there had a, it, that it developed in Israel, you know, two parallel cultures that they couldn't really contact, have any contact with each other, two parallel ways of doing Judaism, two parallel ways of understanding what's right and what's wrong, and it wasn't something that was going to go away. If, if anything, of course, as we know, it's intensified. So I conclude, as I always do, by asking the uh, eternal question: Why do you waste your time reading fiction? Good night. <laughs>